Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the third channel. Hooray! We're back doing the interviews on the third channel. Yes, but it doesn't mean this isn't as important as every other interview across all 20 YouTube channels. I know, I do a lot. Don't blame me. Blame my head. Well, do. Well, you have to blame me because my head's attached to my body. But that's beside the point. But today we're here with a very, very, very special interview because. His career is getting even bigger than it already was um, four days ago. Um, because it's getting even bigger. And, and you'll find out why. Uh, you, you really will find out why. Because it's on the, on the list of things that make me go, oh. So you'll find out why. He's best known for writing a bunch of amazing programs that we'll get on to. But the one I will mention is he's best known for writing some of the amazing, the UK version better than the American version, Murder in Successville, it's the one and only Joel Murray Morris. Greetings. Hello. So we, we shall start at the correct point in life, <laughs> uh, the beginning, but not the very beginning of all time, but the beginning of where careers begin. How did you get into writing? Um... I really wanted to do it when I was very small. Um, and I used to I used to answer this and tell people how I got into writing professionally, but that's not important, is it? You need to know when you want to get into writing. Um, I loved comedy when I was really small, um, and I wanted to do it. The same way people do with music, like you know, like music and you want to do it. And I, I want I like comedy, but I wanted to do it. And so when I was about five or six, I started. I really liked comics, so I started making my own. Yeah. And then by the time I was seven, I I turned pro because I start I sold them in the playground, <laughs> um, which basically I I, I keep going. What, what's your origin story? Went, yeah, that's it. Basically, I want. I really thought comics were funny, and I thought if you copied them, it's like being in a, doing cover versions. Yeah. Um, if I copied them, then I could sell them in the playground for like a few pence, and if you sold several copies, that was enough to buy a chocolate bar. Yeah. That's all. That's it. And uh, that, that's how Lord Sugar also became a multimillionaire yeah. by selling mini computers in the playground. Yeah. And one of the things you've done that has gone catastrophic, such as, um, I can't remember the actor's name, so do a point of book, the book that played Brian from My Parents and Aliens uh, has a copy of this. What? Where did the idea for Be Funny or Die come from, your, your brand new book that's just out? Oh, that, that's basically... <laughs> I've been obviously I've been doing I've been writing comedy since I was about well trying to make people laugh with 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 written comedy since I was about six uh, and I thought actually what I should do probably is write down what I've learned because there's a lot of years of that so yeah it was I, I when I was probably not when I was six but maybe when I was 19 18 19, I would have killed for a book like this I bought every book about comedy you could get and I went to the library and I got them out um and I liked I liked books of things like scripts mm. because very often the the writers would then would tell you how they'd written it. There'd be notes, yeah. footnotes, yeah. and yeah. explanations. And I just I'd, I'd I'd scour them for clues. Um, so I loved reading accounts of how other people have written. So basically, be funny or die was me thinking. There's lots of stuff. People say you can't analyse comedy. And I think that's a silly thing to say because, of course, you can. You can analyse anything. Um, whether it's any good or not, it's a different thing. But um, I play music as well. And I thought, what I understand about music, I'm not a trained musician, but I know chords and notes and what the notes are called. And it doesn't spoil music. And I thought, I think I have the same approach to comedy. I know what the notes are called. and the. So I thought I'd write a book that... that attempted to talk about comedy in the same way people talk about music saying you don't spoil the magic yeah. but you can probably explain there's there's three chords in it <laughs> yeah. and and is is the uh do you reckon that the this ver this book this version of the category of breaking down uh comedy do you reckon this is uh, a version that improves on previous versions because in the book you mentioned Jimmy Carl's uh, history of jobs. Do you reckon that this is a step forward in making it even more detailed than other books in the similar category? That's a very good question. 
obviously I read all those books because obviously I, I'd read those books anyway because I like reading about comedy. Um, and they're really, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy and Lucy Greaves' book is brilliant. It's really, really good. And Stuart Lee's book about stuff. But the thing that, that I got fascinated by was a lot of those people who got to write those books were stand-ups, yeah. stand-up comedians because they're famous enough to get a book deal. <laughs> um, but I always like, I'm, I'm not a performer. I'm a backroom person. I write in the backroom. So basically, not many, not since the 70s or 80s have many of those guys, American guys do it, but no, yeah. no one in Britain had done it yeah. for ages. Um, and I think a lot of those books are about the sort of jokes that stand-ups tell. Yeah. And also about doing things like crowd work and making audiences. And that's different to what I do because I write for things like Viz magazine and, and I write books and stuff and, and knowing how to like get a crowd on side is no use if i'm doing a spoof advert for, for for a magazine what i was interested in is is the other stuff which you might do if you're if you're not a stand-up you might do if you're trying to make your make a funny birthday card for a friend or something uh and i thought actually there are there are loads of forms of comedy that don't get talked about that way so it was an attempt to do something where I was like Stephen Hawking <laughs> trying to find a universal theory of, of, of how every joke from a sitcom to a crack Christmas cracker yeah. must follow some sort of rules. Like every tune from a doorbell to a symphony, it's the same notes, but at different lengths, <laughs> more, more complex. So yeah, I was trying to find something that, that connected all those things that made, made all funny stuff work. And I, I, the, the conclusion I came to was that it was to do with, how human beings are, why we laugh. Yeah. And I think that the book's really good because you, you were saying a lot of Americans, uh, I don't know where it is or, or else I'll put <laughs> the next album. But I've got one of the, one of the well, I say box standard because you just Google comedy book and it'll yeah. be a list of box standard of comedy books. But I've got this comedy book that, that thinks it knows how to separate. But because it is American, you, you sort of want the British equivalent. And I think this book um be funny or die is the british equivalent but it's oh, in more you. detail and and because of your years of experience it works better and i think when you listen to the audiobook version it's you get more of an understanding because you understand your passion in your voice because uh passion always works better when you spend an hour talking on end about a subject that you, <laughs> that you by the end of it you're probably fed up with well i think i think my, like most I see, this is the other thing. It's like most comedy writers, I talk about this stuff all the time. Um, and I, 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 we're unbearable. It's like stand-ups, are they? They end up just hanging out with other stand-ups. Um, we just talk about this stuff all the time. And I, I, it was really funny. People sometimes say, well, how can you talk about this? How can you analyse this? And you're thinking, oh, God, you don't. Oh, everyone else I know does. They might do it. It's a bit like the magic circle. You might do it behind a door. But everyone's talking about these things and exchanging these these techniques and tricks. And, and you wouldn't be able to do the job. It's a bit like if you formed a band and everyone didn't agree that that note was G and that note was C and that, that was D. It would be a terrible noise. And most people who work in comedy, te technicians, the producers, directors, editors and writers do have a common language that we use. So I think I was just trying to trying to put that into the book. And then obviously when I'm talking about that, I find it really exciting. I, I like this nerdy stuff. I really enjoy it. So I hope, I mean, I'm really glad you enjoyed the audio, but I really enjoyed reading it because it was an attempt to get, to try and get over the fact this isn't a nerdy book that, yeah. that ruins comedy. I'm really excited that comedy works like this. It's brilliant. Yeah. yeah and, and I think analysing comedy are really interesting because, uh, because of the whole people reviewing TV shows uh, on the internet, I, I then developed a YouTube channel that was made to like rip comedy apart. Like, <laughs> It was called, and now it, it still is, it's still alive. It's called, and now for something completely different, which is a reference to the Monty Python words, and use that in the intro because it's copyright free, apparently. Yeah, um, you can do it, it's just a TV thing, to what TV yeah. people say. And and so it, it so, the, so I, I like the idea of it, analyse it, because it's like, I, I analyse it a lot because it's, yeah. I'm sad and I've got no friends, uh, <laughs> and I've got enough time <laughs> hands to, to analyse and go, Yes, and I think and I think books like these are always really interesting. You mentioned earlier about script books, and they're also incredible. I've got a small collection of them. Um, the back end of one's a little bit too thick, so some of the others <laughs> won't fit in it. But I do I do think that that comedy books need to be more widely known because I think it's just yeah. smaller. So things like if you like not like many people know about them, but I think this book being so spread out like it's gonna be. Um, because like like I said, for instance, 
the boy that plays Brian from My Parents and Aliens, uh, posted oh. about it, and he is in- incredible. So once he's going to copy, then it's just going to. Go that's any, uh, that basically that that's the who you're trying to get them to. Forget Richard Osman. You want to get it to Tony Gardner. That's the most important person. You've got to reach him. Yeah. I, I think. I mean, I, I I'm genuinely I'm passionate about this. I I what made me first like comedy was I liked it on TV. I really liked funny books. Yeah. I'd get books, funny books out of the library. And obviously, when you're a little kid, you get funny books out of the library because you're getting your like picture books and they're Dr. Zeus or whatever. And then I just carried on. I, just, I, didn't, I didn't grow out of them. I then went to the adult versions of those, which were the, the novelty books you got for Christmas. And I said this to some to Robin Ince. I said, whenever I go into a bookshop, I don't go to the literature section or the sci-fi section or the yeah. biography. I go to the humour section first yeah. and see if they've got any old, know, old Calvin and Hobbes books or or old comedy annuals from the past. I that's they're my favorite books and when i i was lucky enough to get some comedy books out i've yeah. never been happier because my books then were next to the those classic the monty python books or the the books i grew up with they're my favorite books and people people love funny books yeah. the publishing industry doesn't love funny books but people but human beings really yeah. do yeah. and i think the internet loves well loves to try to create funny books it was when i was <laughs> it was like 11 someone uh had decided and, and I'd, it was an odd thing to find had bought me a book about a bloke who was a stick figure who was just faffing about with a poo and that was a whole book for That's like it. 12 pages it was just prodding poo for the whole time yeah i think i mean honestly i i don't i don't uh i don't have any uh i would never dismiss that i was talking to a comic novelist uh last night and said the funny thing is people always say oh our funny books don't sell and then you do those those um surveys of the hundred most beloved books and what always wins it's always hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy alice in wonderland adrian mole bridget jones terry pratchett uh pg woodhouse even and you go oh actually no the top 20 books everyone's ever loved they're all funny and yet the weird thing is people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't really like. I mean, comedy is really weird for it to be sort of a niche interest when you go, yeah. everyone likes laughing, don't they? Yeah. yeah. And and the issue with, with, with comedy being niche is that even the Oscars don't want to nominate yeah. comedy films and win comedy films in general, which, which is people think is slightly weird. But it's because, I think it's because there's a lot of comedy films that are really good. So there's not enough room for them to fit in because there's too many or else. That's not- a very good logic. No one else. I th- I th- yeah, I th- yeah, you'd have to name all of them. But I th- it's the really funny thing whenever you ask an actor and you say, "What's easier, comedy or drama?" They always go, "Oh, God, comedy is much, much harder." And then they go up and collect all the awards for drama, and you go, "Well, that was the easy one. You told us that was easy. Yeah. You, go, I want, I want to, I want you to win for the the funny ones because they're apparently they're much harder." <laughs> and now moving away slightly from that, but sticking in the same category, one of the things you worked on was um, this this program that didn't seem to garner the wide audience it needed, but still lived off the hype of uh, the iteration it was trying to uh, like use its uh, IP from. What were they like working on? And I thought it was incredible. What were they like working on the incredible Newsoids? Newsoids? Oh, my God. That's uh, You're digging down there. Um, it was... Well, I think Newsoids was... Everyone's always trying to make that show. Because on radio... There's always a, a current affairs impressionsy kind of show on, uh, so they've got lots of trained writers who, weirdly, when you get into comedy, the first thing they train you to do is to write that because yeah. there's always one of those. Whether it, back in the day, it read spitting image or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they 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 have a huge team of, of of writers, especially new young writers, who can write that sort of thing, and they try and take it to television, and it almost never works. Um, I don't know why. It's it's really hard to move that to TV, and occasionally it does. I I, th- I thought Mash was really good, but like uh, they, they they try and move it over. And Newsboys was one of those attempts to try and get that to go across, and it, it's like there should all I always says there should always be one of these on TV, and always be one of these on radio. Yeah. They don't. They, they, I don't. No, why they keep having to reinvent the wheel in America, like SNL, it yeah. would be on season 146. They should just say there's a show on TV that's a bit like Dead Ringers or Spitting Image, where you do celebrity impressions about the news, yeah. and there should be a show on TV that's a bit like The Onion, which is made up funny stories that are about the way the world is. And you should just make endless series of that, <laughs> doesn't need different titles or different people, just you inherit it, but it's like it's like. It's like the news is on. The news should be, and there should be a comedy news program as well. Yeah. And the only one that's happened with is "Have I Got News for You?" But they should be on. 
that you should be on season 146 of the day to day, I think, because people like to write that stuff and it's still really funny as an idea. And instead of that, they keep trying to relaunch them. And Newsoids was trying to, was sort of trying to do Spitting Image again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and and because of like Newsoids being being this unique thing, then years later they brought back Spitting Image. Yeah. And now you can't even watch the reboot of Spitting Image anyway because they removed it from BritBox and removed it from existence. Isn't that weird? All that work. I mean, it breaks my heart. I mean, it's one of the, the things that I think is really hard to talk about for people trying to get into comedy because I got into comedy because there were there were there were classic comedies as you said Monty Python that you were told to in order to understand the history of comedy you must know the goons and Monty Python and these following. and there so you're always thinking well, well when I, when I make my thing it will be a classic and it will be known forever yeah. and now you do it and the prize is for it to be removed from history completely yeah. um and it, it gives the it, it it creates the impression that everything good was was a long time ago and actually the, the quality of writing on modern shows is is no different than it was in the 60s or 70s or 80s or 90s. Yeah. And one of the things you've worked on and still are working on mm. uh, is in in no particular order that, that doesn't upset anyone, in my top 10 list of favourite podcasts, what's it like uh, hosting the incredible, uh, the warm <gasps> Comfort Blanket podcast? Oh, that's nice, that is. I was lovely. It was a, we'd, uh, we've been doing Rule of Three for ages, and then for loads of reasons, it became impossible to do Rule of Three. One of the things that made Rule of Three, which was a comedy analysis podcast, became impossible to. I thought we'd done everything. There about two things we hadn't done. And the other one was we used to take advantage of the fact that people were in town, like in London. We were in London, and everyone was having meetings, so you just grabbed them before a meeting, and you could get comedians in. What I really want to do is the opposite of like a, a sort of analysis podcast but still do one which was just about the warmest things you can do so comfort blanket the idea is people bring on the thing they go back to again and again and again which can be a book or a tv show or a film and it also means i can do stuff that isn't just comedy though the comedy ones i love doing yeah. um because that's my special passion but it also means you can talk about rage of the lost ark or married at first sight or, or anything that we or wham it doesn't matter i could talk about anything um we did a really good one on the dungeons and dragons players handbook if something makes you happy you can do it um <laughs> And the, the trick with that is to invite someone on who is who 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 has chosen something, and I try and make them choose the most obvious thing possible. They'll often say, "Oh, I really like this Czechoslovakian animation." I went, "Yeah, but do you like ABBA?" And then people have to go, "Well, okay, actually, really, I really like ABBA." So, which album is it? ABBA Gold? Is it the best of ABBA? And then they have to do the most obvious thing in the world, and then you just ambush them with enormous analysis of something that they love, but maybe haven't thought about very hard and my favorite thing it's a bit like the, the book try and take something which you take for granted that you just love and then ask yourself seriously why you love it so it's just about people loving stuff and the lovely thing for me is that by the time someone comes on my job is to love the thing they love as much as they love it so we both spend a few days looking at it and by the end of it the enthusiasm is never fake because spend three or four days watching someone's favorite thing that they've recommended to you unless you're a real idiot you will learn to love it and 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 you'll a, a bit of studying you just both turn up massively enthusiastic about something which is most of the media isn't that yeah you're usually supposed to the rule used to be that if someone came on who liked something you had to book someone who hated it for okay. balance and i just went this is terrible i want to have two people who are massively enthusiastic about something just yeah. go this is great yes it's great do you agree i agree yeah and and what's unique about that is that, that because you've got so many different people on it and so many different concepts, it means that you don't have to create, um, uh, this is my downfall, but you don't have to create millions of podcasts about each individual thing you, yeah. you're really obsessed about because you can spend an episode and, and that person that's listening won't get bored of it because you they've chosen that episode to listen to because they are interested in that Thank you. as well. I mean, I hope that's how it works. I mean, I know, I know that there are probably there are people who who wish I was still just doing comedy every week, but I I, I like the variety. The, the the a diet is better with with different vegetables in it, not just all the yellow food. Um, and the comedy one was getting a bit yellow food because uh, it's all the no matter what what you say about it, <laughs> what the book's about, it's all sort of the same tricks. I, I like the fact that that it's um that we can do I don't know, nineteen forties horror films, and yeah. then uh, and it's just about enthusiasm i don't just like one thing i love comedy but it's not the only thing i like because 
be a really dull if one person likes one thing only and only talks about that one thing. And I'm not talking about myself with Doctor Who completely in the background, uh, which it makes out like it's only Doctor Who. But that's beside the point. So, and <laughs> moving on, I'm slightly before I dig myself into a bigger hole. Um, what are the things that's fine. Worked... That's fine. I was watching State of Decay earlier on. It's fine. We're all secretly thinking about Doctor Who all the time. It's fine. You're in safe place. It's not a bad thing. Uh, well, it is when you it is when you spend thousands and thousands of pounds and <laughs> all Doctor Who stuff around the corner, and, oh, no, no. and I've got more in drawers. I'm running out of room. Um, I'm it, glad you're looking after it. If if the apocalypse happens, you have got all the Doctor Who stuff. That's brilliant. Yeah, I've got every DVD of all the programs, and then I've got all the Blu-ray boxes of all the pro of all the of all the stories, and I've got them in multiple different formats. Well, I, I, any Doctor Who fan knows it's always at risk of being wiped by someone. So yeah. the, I'm glad you've got it. And I've accidentally, this is the funniest bit, I didn't realise at the time, but I've accidentally got a German copy of the TV movie by accident. Because <laughs> when I saw it on Amazon, I didn't realise it was German until I opened it and, and someone said, you know, that's in German. I went, oh. So I just ha- Hair it. Doctor Who, Hair Doctor Vare. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things we've worked on that is uh, both intriguing, amazing, and had an awful American remake that no one should ever watch, but for no apparent reason, it's Netflix original, and the BBC bought the rights to wear it, even though we can watch it on Netflix. What would they like working on the amazing original version of Murder uh, in Successful, especially Series 3? It was insane. I was just one of the maddest jobs ever. I mean, the, the guys who make that, Tom and, and, and Andy, and everyone, they're, just, they're just incredible. They're just brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, comic people and Tom just has funny bones uh, as as anyone who's who's seen Wonka knows Tom is just so funny uh, and it was it was when the pitch came over so do you want to work on this the answer was obviously no because this is insane the pitch <laughs> until you've seen it it sounds like the worst cheesy it's not going to work it's all you can think like it's like sort of someone, do you want to do you want to get up in this it was like being asked to go up in the first space rocket no this is going to explode <laughs> it's going to kill us all this is a terrible like, this machine will not fly because it was this hybrid of about a million different things and it sounded tacky and dumb and everything and a friend I know, Toby Davis, was working on it. He said, no, you've got to come on board. A, these guys are brilliant. And B, I think it's going to work. And so the fun of it was was turning up and going, and everyone not knowing. No one was um, was in a rut. Everyone was trying something different. Because the idea was it, it was going to involve celebrities, uh, but not be a prank thing, as in they'd know they would be part of it. And you, people who couldn't act were something going to have to act. Partly improvised, but you had to know a lot. They had to, you had to write loads and loads of script in case they went off off script and but on top of that you had these incredible improvisers who were coming in to play characters they were doing celebrity impressions it was so many it was such a mess of 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 things that were meant to make you happy and it could have gone wrong and it it, when we saw the first i think they they changed the order i think the the one that that we've written went out first uh and it really really worked they moved the order around and they went oh god your ones worked and it was like the proof of concept one and we watched it went oh my god this is really funny um but in order to get it to fly, lots of very clever decisions had to be made. Yeah. And when they did the American one, they made lots of the mistakes that we tried not to make. And you, 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 the funny thing was, you always want to say to the Americans, just come and ask us, we've made this. And what we've learned is what not to do. And one of the most important things is we we would never employ people as the celebrities, because the celebrity had to pretend to be a detective alongside Tom. Yeah. We said, don't get anyone who can act. And don't actually try not to get anyone who's funny. Try not to get comedians. Because what we've got is we've got a massive cast of like Colin Holt and Jenny Bede and people like that and Carrie Ed Lloyd to be uh, comic actors in it. So there are comedians in it who are playing the other characters. So the person in the middle mustn't be a comedian. And the rule we came up with, because we're comedy historians, was uh, Morecambe and Wise. They have to be Morecambe and Wise guest stars. The people who in the 70s would have been the guest star on a variety show and you wouldn't expect them to be able to dance or sing. Yeah. A bit comic relief, as in you're not expecting the newsreaders or actually Strictly Come Dancing. You're not expecting Bill Bailey to be able to... Actually, Bill Bailey is not... You don't expect him to be a dancer, but you would expect him to be able to do a, an improv comedy show. Yeah. So we just said you need to be reality TV stars, people who are antiques experts, <laughs> uh, newsreaders. It's yeah. got to be that grade of... There's a very strange grade of celebrity who <laughs> it's really fun to see if they're a good sport. Yeah. Um, and the people who came on it, some of them people I'd never bloody heard of, 
uh, but they turned to be brilliant. And the idea was they would they had to be out of their depth, and they weren't trying to impress because their career didn't depend on them being great actors. Yeah. And then when the Americans did it, they they got in loads of really good improv comedians, and you go, well, they've ruined the whole thing. The point being, it has to be ex footballers and people who do cookery shows because then it's funny. Yeah. And and I think I think the concept worked really well, and it worked best when Deborah Meaden was on it because oh, she's so you good. you don't expect. Deborah Mead and behave the way she is because she was she she went she did that then she was in an episode of Mandy where she mentioned she she wanted to do Taskmaster and then she did Taskmaster so I yeah. think Deborah Mead has got this thing where she does things just to try and get on other shows that she's desperately trying to get on so I think it was a a ploy just yeah to, she's well. she's clever she's 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 focused I mean she's a very very nice and 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 incredibly bright so it's a, the thing that works with celebrities like that as well which is a really thing worth knowing is that whenever you um whenever you introduce a new character yeah. if you're doing the first episode of a sitcom whenever you stand up as a stand up behind a microphone and no one knows who you are for the first time you've got to tell people very quickly who you are and then they then they can play games of predicting what you'll do next are you going to yeah. be rude are you going to be uptight are you posh are you not posh whatever the great thing with celebrities is that you if you put them if you use them correctly you drop them into things people know who those characters are as much as they know who father dougal is in father ted you know who deborah meaden is she's that woman out of a thing even if you don't watch her show you know who she's meant to be so if she behaves in character you're delighted and if she behaves out of character you're doubly delighted because she shouldn't do that you drop a, a celebrity into a show well and your expectations of their behaviour, it's like watching episode four of something. You know that character already. They're, it's like watching the second series of a sitcom. You know that, that character. So you can play all those jokes on them. Um, and it's another reason why if you put a, a, put a comedian in there, well, you expect them to be funny. So there's no surprise. Whereas the great thing about putting a, a goalkeeper in there is that they can surprise you. Yeah. And, and do you reckon that the, that the show will ever return um, because it was so incredible and it, it shouldn't have disappeared. Do you want to know why it will never return? This is, do you want some proper insider gossip? I don't know if I'm not supposed to say this. Um, due to the insane way that the BBC works, and I, someone from the BBC can, can, can say I'm wrong about this. This is how I understood it. They may have changed the system. The BBC had to promise it was going to be very efficient to the government, which meant that every time it brought a show back, if it was a success... They had to promise to make it more cheaply, which meant that the more successful your show was, you were punished for making it well. So when they commissioned the first series, they gave us X amount of money, tiny amount of money. It's a BBC Three show. And it, but it's got loads of special effects and fake locations and actors. It's a really complicated, expensive show to make. It's not it's not Richard Osman's House of Games. It's not just four <laughs> people in a row. It's a complicated show to make with writers and actors and things. It, yeah. It's expensive. But it was made very cheaply. It looks great. It looks a million dollars. And when it was a success, which they weren't expecting, it came back and they cut the budget by a quarter. You're supposed to make efficiency savings. And then it was successful again and it had its budget cut by a quarter again, which means it got to a point where it couldn't afford to make it. Um, and that happened. There was a kid's show. It was on. There was a werewolf show, which was a huge hit. And every time it brought Wolf back, there were... Blood. What was it called? Wolfwood. Wolf blood. Every time it came back, you honest, there were fewer and fewer werewolves. Yeah. And it got to a point where it had been so successful, it was about season seven, and they couldn't make it because they couldn't afford to do any special effects. Yeah. Um, and it was a way of saying, um, what you're going to do by making a show is learn how to make it more efficiently. Yeah. And it's a completely business thing. But it, uh, most successful, we would have carried on making it forever. If it hadn't been getting shot, it would eventually just been Tom sitting in a chair with a with a desk lamp. Yeah. Um, and it probably still would have been quite funny because Tom is funny. But it got to a point because it had things like uh, it. It's the terrible thing. It's a spoof detective show, so weirdly, it's sort of as expensive to make as a real detective show because yeah. you can't just pretend the cars there and you can't just pretend they've got police hats. You have to buy the police hats. So yeah, it's very odd. Comedy is a, is a funny beast in that you're supposed to make the show look exactly like the real thing, but for a tiny fraction of the money, and it's really hard. So yeah, uh, we'd love to. I'd love to have carried on making murder successful. It was so funny. But, uh, yeah, we ran out of money. <laughs> well, you mentioned the, the lack of wolves in Wolfwood. What's really <laughs> interesting about Wolfwood that, that, that follows on from your point is that by the, I think it was by like the fourth or fifth series, all the main characters that were in the first series had all left. 
all those gloves is gone. Then they had left the location they were staying. Then they had changed the theme tune so yep. that they could uh, buy uh, an actual song from an actual woman instead of a custom made theme tune they already had. Then they moved locations. They probably just to save money. The whole all point up. of the program was that it was supposed to be hidden. So by the end of it, they were all. He revealed who they were to the entire world, and and then the final series was all running away because they were trying to be killed by everyone. I think everything was everything heads towards the point where it's just someone sitting on a chair with a desk lamp. Yeah. Is the the final series of everything? Should, final series of Doctor Who should be just sitting on a chair with a desk lamp. But it's, I think it's it's a freaky thing that sometimes that that you uh, you succeed at something and they go great. Can you do it cheaper? And the answer is no. You should give us yeah. more money. But yeah, uh, successful was a lovely show. I was stunned by the American version. I couldn't believe yeah. what they got wrong. Uh, because everyone in it was great, and it, it it it's it's it should be a very good format. Um, yeah. It's fun. Yeah, and uh, and you were mentioning Doctor Who should end with them in a sitting on a chair with like, <laughs> Tales from the Tardis is them sitting down in a in a makeshift yeah. Tardis set and cut from episodes, which is fantastic. It's incredible, but it is literally sitting, and they've just got extra lights. It's it doesn't need. Light. I mean, to be honest, things don't need to be. Things don't need to be madly expensive. Someone was telling me that last batch of you like Doctor Who. The last batch of Doctor Who's was made with, with just on the BBC budget. It's not yeah. even Disney. That last batch looks amazing, and they did come up with an episode that was just them running down a corridor. And I go, that's brilliant. I will watch them. Uh, sometimes not having budget makes people very imaginative. And certainly towards the end, what Murder and Success Field, what that was being made on on pennies that shouldn't shouldn't have looked like that, and it looked so good and it was so beautifully put together, uh, and it was it was they were so up against it. But it made them so imaginative, and it just proved that how much those guys liked making that show, and how funny they were that they could still make that show on what was effectively uh, two buttons and a, and a and a bag of two peas. It was brilliant. Yeah. And one of the other shows you've worked on that um, had a really um, speaking of budget, had a really high budget, so high that even even the, the Muppets wanted uh, a PC action. Um, which, which I think just to ever let, makes it even better. What would it like working on the third series of Sky One's um, critically acclaimed, but never BAFTA winning from my knowledge, but is available for £106 on DVD? What would it like working on Yonderland? God, that DVD thing's incredible, isn't it? No one knows who's got the rights to Yonderland. I was talking to Larry Rickard, and he said, no one knows who's got... He said, they would like to re-release Yonderland on DVD for all the Ghosts fans, and they can't. So if you have season one of Yonderland, which I think Larry's mum's got two copies, she's going to sell it and buy a car at some point, because it's just... If she if she can't afford her gas bill, she's going to sell her, her spare copies of Yonderland. Uh, Yonderland is just amazing. It's such a good show. Such a good show. That was... Those when people sort of actually it's quite nice you've asked about nice people uh people say what what are the people you work with like and the answer is they're all really really nice uh but the ghost slot that that horrible histories gang are just the nicest i mean two top to bottom just the nicest funniest most talented people and being in a room with them working on stuff because they're all performers and writer performers yeah. you throw an idea in and it bounces off them and it's like we're describing it as being the closest thing to like working with monty python would you like to just guest in monty python yeah because every time you throw a joke out Every one of them knows which one of them will play that character because yeah. they've got their types, yeah. and they start riffing. And it's the joy of being a writer in a room with really good writer performers is that they take every idea yeah. and they return serve as the game, yeah. but they return serve so that you can send send it back to them, and it gets better and better. I love that. And then going down to visit the show, being recorded, I'm taking my kids down and seeing the puppets being made, and the ambition of it and the love they love labyrinth and the muppets and that's why they wanted to make a big jim henson thing it's it's what's interesting about that as a show this is a technical thing about comedy writing is they're sketch performers and yonderland is a it's a, a story really well-made story but they're all playing different sketch characters they wanted to play six or seven different people because that's what they're good at that's what they've done in horrible histories and ghosts apart from larry who's playing two most and they play the, the plague victims but most of them are playing one character yeah. and i think for an audience to take characters to their hearts, they like you to be one person. And the one person they've all chosen to be in that, apart from maybe Martha, who's nothing, nothing like Fanny, they're all a little bit like their characters. So there's an enormous warmth towards the gang who make it because they've sort of found a character each in Ghosts that they play that's a little bit like them. Yeah. 
uh, or a little bit like their worst side or the things they don't like about themselves or whatever. So that it's really, really honest. And it's the first time they've stepped out from that wig box and the silly and to go, actually, I'm slightly fragile or I'm slightly worried about being uh, pretentious or whatever. It's, it's such a lovely show. But those guys, amazing. And working on Yonderland, uh, what a pleasure to be yeah. even in the room with them. Yeah. And because of how amazing Yonderland is, is there's, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's, there's bloopers on the Netflix news channel from Dark Crystal Age of Resistance because all the puppeteers are not voicing the characters in the actual show. So like, uh, like Simon Pegg and them, what? Yeah, yeah. So they can faff about and say whatever they believe <laughs> like. And so it's this So it reminds me a lot of Yonderland because it's like one of them's stroking and another one singing a song, and then the massive. I can't remember what the, the massive. Well, they've got massive horns. They're all like trying to terrorize the crew as they walk past the set because they're all properly dressed in the costume. So they're all trying to oh. terrorize everyone, and and they're all like, and you can hear them farting, and you can hear all sorts of noises, <laughs> and all the puppets are interacting. It reminds me a lot of Yonderland because it's like ridiculous. Yeah, well, silly. it's all the same. It will be the same puppeteers as well because there's only about six people who can work puppets. Yeah. So everyone <laughs> on Yonderland, they, they they kept losing puppeteers because they were going off to go and do Star Wars and things. Basically, yeah. that. There, it's a really uh, skilled job. If you've ever tried to do it, put a, a sock on your hand. It does not look like Kermit the Frog. The way they 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 give personality to puppets is is magical. Look at that. Look at them. There, puppets. Puppets are amazing. People who can do that magic. There's a, there are really skilled groups. So every time you turn up on a puppet show, and I've done a few puppet shows, the same guys are there, yeah. and they will be doing Jim Henson. They'll be doing um, uh, Yonderland. They'll be doing everything. Um, my favourite puppet puppeteer story was I did a puppet sitcom once and I turned up on set to watch it being recorded and one of the puppeteers came up to me and said, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm, 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 I'm the writer because the writers aren't, aren't on set very often so they don't know who you are. Uh, I said, who are you? I, did, you, did you write this? And I went, yeah, I wrote this. And he went, are you the person who keeps saying he walks out and slams the door? <laughs> but yeah, because it's, it's like a flat share sitcom and they're going to have a fight. And he went, puppets can't close doors. And I went... <laughs> Yeah, of course, puppets can't close. As you said, you will not believe how hard it is, how long it takes. Every time one of the puppets leaves the room, he slams the door. And, and he said, it takes up most of the day. And I never wrote that again in a puppet show. But you <laughs> don't realise that the puppets can't close doors. Of course they can't close doors. Uh, yeah. Idiot. <laughs> yeah. And and Yonderland was one of those programmes where, because of, because they were the puppets were so ingrained in the show, you could have the same puppets come in and do the same gag and you can put them through more torture because they're yeah. not real people. So the ones where it's like the uh, couple that are trying to get oh, yeah. all the time and they always get battered and all sorts. You couldn't do that. It's like with animation. Animation yeah. is good because you can do more with it and with audio dramas. You could do you could do some of the stuff like set, send them to Mars and slice the red yeah. off and make them come back the next week with the red back on and they've just not noticed their heads disappearing well. Vivian did like the young ones, but that's beside the point. Uh, but you can you could do a lot more with with them more imaginative things, and I think that's what worked for Yonderland because it was them all yeah. being ridiculously silly, but it was also puppets, and it, so it wasn't always them, and they could utilize other mediums and and yeah. say to their commissioners, look what I can do. It's it's incredibly broad. I mean, I, this is a, a, a bugbear of mine, and I get, I get a bee in my bonnet about it. Is I think that comedy is incredibly sophisticated and not literal. Uh, you, you grow up watching kids shows and reading comics and things, and you'll accept anything in a in a Roadrunner cartoon or Scooby Doo or, or or in a book or a comic. The most astonishing stretches of logic that in Daffy Duck cartoons and in 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 uh, Ren and Stimpy and things. You you watch the maddest, The Simpsons even. And then you get to a certain age and they go, right, well, put that away. And now you're going to watch sad people in cafes and that sitcom. And you go, well, that, well, that's one sort of sitcom. That's, that's one sort of comedy is about real people going yeah. through emotion stuff. But the weird thing is that the palette of comedy is is as broad, maybe broader than drama. You can have people's heads come off and I will accept because I am a kid who grew up reading comics and watching cartoons that the head will be back on next episode. I will accept while and I won't. I went asked. I was talking to someone about this last night. That sometimes we'll have film in a kunk will catch the camera because yeah. you're allowed to. And I went, that's a standard comic joke that goes back beyond Shakespeare, and has stopped being on television. Yeah. And it doesn't break the reality of it if she looks at the camera. 
it's it's a comic technique and when fleabag did it everyone, oh! and he went no no that's that's a pretty standard thing but comedy has all this vocabulary and this language that 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 you that the characters are rubber and they're uh, they they can explode and 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 they can say something and and just the words will conjure up a magical thing or a sound will do it it's an incredible vocabulary and the, the weird thing that's happened with adult comedy is i think the comedy that's aimed at adults now is so much less sophisticated than the comedy that's aimed at children and the children grow up and they they grow up with the simpsons and uh, yeah. rick and morty for about the edge of where it gets to where you go oh this is the same energy but this is for grown-ups yeah. but adult animation still does it but adult tv takes so many fewer risks with audiences understanding and you can blow i love that about community and things it blew your mind it was mad yeah. and you'd watch it and you go this makes no sense but as an adult you went oh i'm being treated as well as i and when I watch a cartoon, yeah. <laughs> which is the highest, the nicest treatment you can get is a cartoon. Uh, and, and you mentioned there, and one of the things we've worked on uh, was uh, Clunk on Earth, which mm. is the brilliant Diana Morgan, but yeah. recently aired the fantastic third series of Mandy. It was oh. ridiculous. And now that is exactly the kind of comedy that we should be making more of. And I, I, I mean, Diane is, 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 is waging a war there for that. And I'm, I'm, I'm being unfair. There's lots of lovely mad comedy on television, but there's not as much as there used to be. And I think people are frightened of it. Yeah. And bef before I get on to the, 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 the main question, I had, but would you, because cause I always want to, I'm always trying to work it out in, in, in an actual sense, try and work out where, what area of comedy I'm in. Would you say that Diana Morgan would fall into the category of alternative or would you say that no alternative doesn't Ooh. exist because well, that's what everyone's trying to do i don't know she's definitely no she's not actually i tell you what because diane is a really really good actor as well so she can be in that when she's in motherland she's playing it very very realistic and very very grounded and it's not a million miles from how she performs when she's doing bandy to be honest it's the same performance but that wildness her surreality her craziness her, her love of nonsense um is totally welded to reality because she's a very good observer of people. She's she's got an observational strand in her. Yeah. yeah, I'd say she no, she she's not. She's 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 an alternative comedian in the sense that she is an heir to a tradition that you can trace back through her to, to people. But honestly, she's she's not a million miles away from from comedians you think of who maybe used to be alternative and now very mainstream. She's not a million miles away from from French and Saunders. Yeah. who would now be seen as a very, very mainstream act, a heritage act, but when they first came out were really, really alternative. Yeah. So I think, no, Diane's, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. She's very alternative. She studied under Ken Campbell. She's mad for that. Anyone who went through Ken Campbell, it counts for me as, as a representative of something glorious and alternative, and also someone who knows the potential of comedy and the mad things it can do. And she's amazing. She's so good. Yeah. And so with, with Kong, with Philomena Kong, why is why do you reckon that uh, comedy characters like Philomena Clunk and Alan Partridge and you know, all those similar characters that can expand different areas of of media? Why do you reckon that that is so popular once more? That's good. I like that. I mean, it's Alan Partridge is something phenomenal. I mean, the, the the closest thing would be probably Dame Edna Everidge, Barry Humphreys thing. Someone who's who's so big that they've they've escaped from from being a sketch character because Alan Partridge is just a sketch character. He was meant to just be an impression of a sports reporter, but he's now got this entire inner life. When we, I was talking about this recently, when we started doing Diana's Kunk, she was supposed to be, Charlie Brooker said, an absence of character. She was supposed to be so dense. She was like a black hole that nothing went in. There was no information. Why was she on television? It made no sense. That was what was making us laugh. The more she had to actually occupy yeah. a longer period that that wouldn't do and we had to give her an inner life and the inner life was that we gave her was done the same way as uh i've said it was uh, for me it was a victoria wood style thing where yeah. one of the characters would there'd be brand names or references to friends you couldn't see who were off screen yeah. that you'd go oh there is a life off screen in this you've got a dumb mate called paul and she's yeah. a guy called sean or whatever that was a very Victoria Woody thing, but also that, that's that's a pretty standard. Alan Partridge does that as well. Uh, and that was inspired by by those. But the reason people like them is probably that absence of, of information because you put someone on screen and you immediately lean in as, a, as an audience and go, oh, they're a bit odd. What, 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 
what clues I'm looking for clues like you do with a, with a, with any character with, when you meet a new friend go meet go go to a, 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 a go to a, a, a wedding or a, a new job or a new school and you, you're trying to look for clues about who everyone is so we love to do that human beings love to know who these new people are uh, and if they don't give up that information straight away they don't go hello I'm Alan Partridge I live in a in a travel tavern I've got a son called Fernando if you have to wait to find that stuff out yeah. the moment he goes my son Fernando you go oh my god you're obsessed by ABBA that you've named him after an ABBA song that detail rushes in and you're delighted so yeah I, I the comic characters like that I think work really well because people are are looking for clues information yeah. it's 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 a puzzle and people love doing the puzzle going who would end up like that <laughs> And one of the one of the best things I think has happened, I don't know whether or not it was on purpose or by accident, but I was once in, in a lesson at school where it was like near revision time for mocks or whatever. And I had stumbled, I didn't do history, but I stumbled across BBC Biosize history history on the website. And there was a clip or an episode, I, I can't remember exactly the length, of Philomena Clunk talking about history on the BBC history. Amazing. Website. So I bet I, I didn't get paid for that either. Appalling. I sat in the lesson, <laughs> I sat in the lesson watching that, and the, te- the head teacher walked over and went, so uh, what are you doing? I went, oh, yeah, I'm just watching this. It's um, for uh, history. And it really was, because it was on the history bite side. Thing. That's amazing. But it was... I, th- I think... Now you're saying, I think I just signed something that said that was permitted. Like, you get in your contract, say so you're allowed to use it on other things, and one of them was educational uh, use. I was in... Bizarre, I was in a pub last night, uh, Greg Jenner, who used to uh, be the historical consultant for Horrible yeah. Histories, and he's got a new new history book out, uh, and obviously he knows loads of historians, and he was having a book launch, and I ended up, it was one of my favourite places to be, because it was like Kunk, it was a room full of boffins, everyone was an expert on like, on, on ancient Rome or Egypt or anything, um, and they were all turned out to be fans of Kunk, because they love it, because we, they're, they're mates and they're, they're other, they're, they're tutors had been on it and the heads of department had been on it being interviewed um and they said and i said well the, the joke was always there's nothing funny in being an expert on something and i said the other thing is in order to do those jokes we have to read up about all those subjects for her to be wrong about it we have to know what's right so i said we have to read all your books and and we have to, we use bbc bite size for research for kunk because brilliantly it's about the right level for the length of joke we're going to do. so you don't want to go into too deep but it will tell what we're, do, we're doing a joke basically on what people know from history and what people know from history is what they learned at school. So we tend to, we obviously do read proper books and get big research packs on the Aztecs or whatever, but I always watch the BBC bite size on whatever we're doing in order to know what people know and then to get it wrong. Yeah. Um, but the historians all said, yeah, we really like the fact that clearly someone has researched the subject first. <laughs> we have to learn it. Yeah. And, and do you reckon that, um, by it accidentally being on the BBC Bites <laughs> website, people have actually took that as fact. And there is, I'm not saying. Oh, it's, no, it's, no. I see. The, the, the key to this is one of my tutors at college said a brilliant thing, which I really believe. Again, the power of comedy, how comedy is amazing. I was doing uh, American literature or something, and I hadn't read the book for reasons. Maybe I was lazy. Maybe it wasn't in the library. Maybe I'd forgotten to. And I had a very, very good tutor. And she said, I said, quickly, I've got to read the book quickly. I've got to know what's in it. And she went, Go and read a parody. She said, look up. And it was something like Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage, a book I haven't read. And she said, go on to go. Uh, I think the Internet just about existed. Then. She said, go on to the Internet. Look up parody Stephen Crane. She said, read that. I've been Mark Tom or whoever it would be. Uh, read it and you'll know what the book's like. You'll be able to triangulate back what the original was. And it will be like, uh, you know what? If you watch a, a spoof action movie, you can work out what action movies are like. Yeah. And if you watch Philip in the Kunk getting it wrong, I think the clues are there that you could probably work out what really happened. So when she points at um, King Harold on the Bayer Tapestry with the arrow in his eye, and he won by bravely catching the arrow in his eye, <laughs> then you can work out what's really happening there. So maybe that might be the first time you've ever known how King Harold died, but you know he got hit in the eye, there, or at least the myth is that you got hit yeah. in the eye but yeah and very often we'll we'll put stuff in there that that we've researched and and the experts will say oh everyone thinks that's what happens yeah. and the expert that gets it actually no it's, it's more complicated than that so they do get to correct her and i think yeah i don't think it's a bad way of yeah. learning history i love that it was on key stage i'm gonna go looking for it now <laughs> uh, and um 
and so as we're coming towards um the pit stop that I like to call um zooming through to the end before we come towards the end it was that was going to be a trim that's good um as you can see, I didn't watch enough Thomas Tank Engine or else I would know all the train metaphors. <laughs> um, so for anyone that's got to this point in the interview and and uh, are obsessed with either you or me, and we haven't come to the conclusion yeah. yet, which very understandable. The more obsessed with um, probably the latter rather than the former, um, you rather than me. Uh, what advice would you give people that uh, want to get into? Um, writing comedy, not just as a profession, but more as a, it, like a more as a as a hobby and a profession, but like yeah. in general, really. They should sort of be the same, shouldn't they? I always remind myself that when I'm getting grumpy about work, is that I I want to do this, and it is and it is exactly the hobby the hobby version and the professional version is sort of the same muscles being used. Yeah, it's it, it is a yeah. Um, do it. <laughs> um, it's, that's a stupid thing. I, the thing that obsesses me about this industry, all creative arts, is there are gatekeepers. There are people who say, you can't come in, you can't do it. And the question you always ask is, well, how do you get past those? And the answer is, just ignore them. I mean, I I went and applied. I, I started writing professionally very young. I was, I was at school, so I was 18 or 19. And I sold my first joke to TV. I, I sent it up to a TV show and they, they bought one. It was a rubbish joke, but they bought it. And I went, oh God, I'm a professional comedy writer. I didn't really work again for about 10 years. So I thought, oh, well, that didn't work. I did it and I turned up for lots of meetings and couldn't sell anything. I thought, this is a terrible job. So I went and got another job and I worked in, in, in shops and things. Um, and what got me back into the industry was making something myself. Yeah. And the thing is, because of YouTube channels and, and I don't think the the industry does itself any favors by saying everyone should just go and make things by themselves because it takes ages to make good stuff yeah. and it's and it is expensive and you should be doing something else with your time uh but no one can stop you yeah the best advice i ever got i got loads of good advice from professional people along the way but i was i i sent some i sent some jokes to charlie brooker who i vaguely knew from i'd done some shifts on a computer magazine when charlie was on the computer magazine next door so I knew, and he suddenly had this website that was really funny called TV Go Home. And I thought, I'd like to write for this man who writes this very funny website. So sent some, got some friends together and we wrote a load of jokes and sent it to Charlie. And Charlie sent an email back and it was the best email I've ever received because it was really rude. I won't swear, but he used a lot of swear words. And he said, this mf is good and you mfs know it is. Mf <laughs> off and leave me alone. And I dropped a line back and said, look, I know you well enough to say, why are you telling us to run her off? And he said, I'm not anyone special. I've just got a website. And I said, well, how do you get a website? He went, it cost 25 quid, you idiot. And he <laughs> told me where he got it from. And I went and bought my own website from the same people and said to my friends, uh, we're not working for TV Go Home. We'll have to think of something else to put on our website. We came up with a thing called the Framley Examiner, which is a spoof local newspaper, filled it up within two weeks. And within two weeks after that, we had a book deal. And within two weeks after that, I was being asked to work on TV. Now, I could have queued up forever. I could even have asked Charlie, to, can I come and work for your website? But he just told me to go away and make my own. Yeah. And I, when I look back on my career, I go, that's the best piece of advice I ever had, which is that he wasn't anyone special. And actually, what you needed to do was get your jokes to an audience yeah. and then they'd either laugh or not laugh. And that is, as a writer, the equivalent of being a stand-up and going on open mic nights. Yeah. No one can stop you. And the weird thing is, because of the internet and because of how comedy works, yeah. you can reach an audience now in a way that you couldn't do in the 1960s. Yeah. And I think that's the, the piece of advice I'd give is, of course, you should be being paid for your work and you should do it professionally and you should learn how to take notes and how to work with producers. But the most important thing is to know whether you're funny or not. And you can do that by doing what you're doing, being funny in, 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 in podcasts and YouTube and things. Yeah, and, and I think I think because of the age of YouTube, I think that sort of works in your, well, works in your favour, but doesn't always work in your favour because it gives you freedom to do literally anything. So I, I have a YouTube channel called Tom's Comedy Club uh, yes, an original title, yes. Uh, <laughs> not really, I tried to come up with other ideas. Then I Google it and it's actually a name of an actual comedy club. Uh, <laughs> I was up for a winner. And so I spent, I don't know, like half an hour filming a two-second sketch called The Elephant in the Room. And you can see I couldn't be bothered putting them away, so they're still in the background. Mm. And I, well, I did it for Adrian with the wrong elephant, but I realised it was missing features, such as the right <laughs> elephant. 
And all it was was I said, you don't talk about the elephant in the room. And then I voiced over the elephant saying, well, they don't talk to me. And, that was, <laughs> and I did it several different times because I had to make sure it was at several different lengths and make sure it was correct. And I uploaded it like 12 times before I realised I got it wrong 12 times. Yeah. And, and I, I do think that YouTube is an interesting part because you can literally do anything. And, and it works in, in favour because it's like websites used to be the high, high end of things and now people are just creating comedy on whatever budget and being really... I'll tell you the, se the secret. You must know this. The other secret is because there's no one in the way, there's no one saying no, you can do anything. Yeah. And I'm a really firm believer that you should pretend you're doing this stuff for someone. Yeah. That you're doing it for like Sir Dennis business at the BBC or something. <laughs> pretend there's someone who you're going to have to give this into. Because the difference between stuff that is really good and stuff that is just okay is that if you make stuff for YouTube or websites or TikTok or anything that looks like it's been commissioned by a TV company, you'll behave differently. When we did Family Examiner, we, everyone was swearing because Charlie had sworn in TV game. And we said, what if we don't swear? And we had these rules. We only swore in the classified ads because we thought that's somewhere that an editor wouldn't have got rid of it. So we had these rules. And we went, okay. And we said, okay, well, we'll use photograph. We'll do our photographs like this, and we'll we'll make sure we'll build the entire world. We'll know who the mayor is. Well, we did we did more work than we needed to do before we started, and it meant that when it came out, everyone this is very professional. And he went, it's not professional. We haven't been paid a penny for it, but it looked like it was of an equal quality to stuff that had been made yeah. by people we really admired, and sometimes just saying i'm going to edit it i'll make it shorter i won't do an hour i'll do 20 minutes and it might take you a day to edit that but it will always pay off it always you put that effort in and you're immediately ahead of the pack and it also gives you good um, working practices because you you're it's like you're handing in homework yeah. the, the the most fun to do is to not hand homework in and do whatever the hell you like but if you pretend you're handing homework in, I think you behave differently and you set yourself higher standards. And I think the people who are really, really good on uh, open access forums, the people who, who work really hard. And yeah. that's it. And, and I think I think another good example of doing your own thing and up becoming successful, um, not just your website, it's um, recently with, um, I can't pronounce her actual name, but a name on YouTube and a name that she's now using a sitcom is Chi. With a, with a C, but mm. and her name is Jean. She's got her own BBC Three sitcom from her YouTube yeah. stuff where yes. she see other people. And so doing it herself made, yeah. made her career. Uh, I think so. Um, people just do nothing. Everyone forgets that. That was just a, a YouTube thing, and those guys are just amazing. And th their thing was that they people just do nothing, which is a great show. Should have just been a bunch of scrotes messing about. But their standard was they wanted to make something that was as good as Only Fools and Horses. They're very, very, they love traditional sitcom. And you watch that and you go, no, it is written like a 1980s British sitcom. They'd set themselves these incredible standards to make sure the characters were solid. No one had told them to. I think the thing is, if you're, a, if you're your own boss, you should be quite a mean boss. <laughs> you should tell yourself off. That's not good enough bit more edit. and i think it really pays off i think that the, the the things that i've always really enjoyed doing is when i'm doing something for no money for my own pleasure i i work too hard at it yeah and that's actually that's that's free yeah. me working too hard at it is free and it and it makes the thing better and then pe people will notice it. it is it's not a level playing field because some people have huge advantages yeah. uh so, it's free outside income and things like that uh, amazing cameras but most of the stuff you can do on a laptop now the only thing that's stopping it being brilliant is how hard you're prepared to work and i think people who do good work just tend to work harder and so as we come to the uh, climax the dramatic clause <laughs> of this interview um where can first of all where can people uh, buy uh, the book both in physical digital and audio forms yeah, that's available everywhere. It's Be Funny or Die, How Comedy Works and, and Why It Matters by Joel Morris. It's published by Unbound. Uh, Unbound are, uh, it's like being on an indie label. They're a sort of, uh, they're, they're, they're sort of they, 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 they fund books and things. And they're, they're an alternative publisher. So they aren't necessarily in as many bookshops as 
as it would be if it was published by Hodder or Penguin. But you can definitely get it places. It's available in Waterstones and things. You might not see big piles of it, but it's definitely out there. You can order it from all the usual places. The audiobook's available. That's that, that We've got that out. I think you can even get that in the States. I think it's coming out worldwide pretty soon. Um, it's available everywhere. It's selling really well, and people are really, really liking it. So you should be able to find it somewhere. And go into local bookshops and ask for it, because I was on front row last night talking about it. So basically, it's a thing. It does exist. Um, go and ask for it and, and get some on shelves demand it be on shelves uh any bookshop will get it for you because it's published it's real <laughs> and and secondly where can people find you but please do not give away your home address no that'd be really weird you can probably work it out and triangulate it from from the gps on this now i'm on most social media as grail frit which is a, a reference to faulty towers it's what's written on the menu when basil types grapefruit too quickly <laughs> But I've been Grail for it for, since, the, since the internet almost began and I've just never moved off it. So I'm Grail for it, G-R-A-L-E-F-R-I-T, most places. Uh, I'm on those places. Uh, the podcast is called Comfort Blanket. Uh, you can find that on all the podcast platforms. I've got a sub stack called, I, uh, which you can find just to look for my name. And that's me putting ideas up, usually about comedy. I write about that. And I've got a YouTube channel where I do things as well, which is on there. But look for Joel Morris and comedy writer. I'm most places. And so, there you have it. Another glorious, excellent interview. And, and as I previously mentioned, Raymond Mearns, no, I haven't swallowed that dictionary just yet. Um, I, I was eating it the other day. I, was, I got to like the A, and I got really full. I, it was it was um, my appetite. And no, I can't think of another A word. Uh, that, that joke has failed. Woo! Because uh, um, it wasn't brilliant. Yes, as you can see, I ate the first page of the bees as well. So, anyway, guys, thank you guys for watching. And remember, no, I've forgotten. <laughs>